Part 8 The girls at this time did not in the least smoke the mystery of this new customer, but Mrs. Cole, as soon as we were conveniently alone, insured me, in virtue of her long experience in these matters, that for this bout my charms had not missed fire, for that by his eagerness, his manner and looks, she was sure he had it. The only point now in doubt was his character and circumstances, which her knowledge of the town would soon gain her sufficient acquaintance with to take her measure upon. And effectively, in a few hours, her intelligence served her so well that she learned that his conquest of mine was no other than Mr. Norbert, a gentleman originally of great fortune, which, with a constitution naturally not the best, he had vastly impaired by his over-violent pursuit of the vices of the town, in the course of which, having worn out and stalled all the more common modes of debauchery, he had fallen into a taste of maiden hunting, in which chase he had ruined a number of girls, sparing no expense to compass his ends, and generally using them well till tired, or cooled by enjoyment, or springing a new face, he could with more ease disembarrass himself of the old ones and resign them to their fate, as his sphere of achievements of that sort lay only amongst such as he could proceed with by way of bargain and sale. Concluding from these premises, Mrs. Cole observed that a character of this sort was ever a lawful prize, that the sin would be not to make the best of our market of him, and that she thought such a girl as I only too good for him at any rate, and on any terms. She went then, at the hour appointed, to his lodgings in one of our inns of court, which were furnished in a taste of grandeur which had a special eye to all the conveniences of luxury and pleasure. Here she found him in ready waiting, and after finishing her pretense of business, and a long circuit of discussions concerning her trade, which she said was very bad, the qualities of her servants, apprentices, journey women, the discourse naturally landed at length on me, when Mrs. Cole, acting admirably, the good old prating gossip, who lets everything escape her when her tongue is set in motion, cooked him up a story so plausible of me, throwing in every now and then such strokes of art, with all the simplest air of nature, in praise of my person and temper, as finished him finally for her purpose, while well, nothing could be better counterfeited than her innocence of his. But when now fired and on edge, he proceeded to drop hints of his design and views upon me, after he had, with much confusion and pains, brought her to the point she kept as long aloof from as she thought proper, of understanding him, without now affecting to pass for a dragoness of virtue, by flying out into those violent and ever suspicious passions, she stuck with a better grace and effect to the character of a plain, good sort of a woman that knew no harm, and that getting her bread in an honest way was made of stuff easy and flexible enough to be wrought upon to his ends by his superior skill and address. But, however, she managed so artfully that three or four meetings took place before he could obtain the least favourable hope of her assistance, without which he had, by a number of fruitless messages, letters, and other direct trials of my disposition, convinced himself there was no coming at me, all which, too, raised at once my character and price with him. Regardful, however, of not carrying these difficulties to such a length as might afford time for starting discoveries, or incidents unfavourable to her plan, she at last pretended to be won over by mere dint of entreaties, promises, and, above all, by the dazzling sum she took care to wind him up to the specification of, when it was now even a piece of art to feign at once a yielding to the allurements of a great interest, as a pretext for her yielding at all, and the manner of such as might persuade him that she had never dipped her virtuous finger in an affair of that sort. Thus she led him through all the gradations of difficulty and obstacles necessary to enhance the value of the price he aimed at, and in conclusion he was so struck with the little beauty I was mistress of, and so eagerly bent on gaining his ends of me, that he left her even no room to boast of her management in bringing me up to her mark. 
he drove so plumb of himself into everything tending to make him swallow the bait. Not but in other respects, Mr. Norbert was not clear-sighted enough, or that he did not perfectly know the town, and even by experience, the very branch of imposition now in practice upon him. But we had his passion, our friend, so much, he was so blinded and hurried on by it, that he would have thought any undeception a very ill office done to his pleasure. Thus concurring, even precipitately, to the point she wanted him at, Mrs. Cole brought him at last to hug himself on the cheap bargain he considered the purchase of my imaginary jewel was to him, at no more than three hundred guineas to myself, and a hundred to the progress, being a slender recompense for all her pains, and all the scruples of conscience she had now sacrificed to him, for this the first time of her life, which sums were to be paid down on the nail upon livery of my person, exclusive of some no inconsiderable presents that had been made in the course of the negotiation, during which I had occasionally but sparingly been introduced into his company at proper times and hours, in which it is incredible how little it seemed necessary to strain my natural disposition to modesty higher, in order to pass it upon him for that of a very maid, all my looks and gestures ever breathing nothing but that innocence which the men so ardently require in us, for no other end than to feast themselves with the pleasures of destroying it, and which they are so grievously, with all their skill, subject to mistakes in. When the articles of the treaty had been fully agreed on, the stipulated payments duly secured, and nothing now remained but the exaltation of the main point, which centred in the surrender of my person up to his free disposal and use, Mrs. Cole managed her objections, especially to his lodgings, and insinuations so nicely that it became his own mere notion and urgent request that his copy of a wedding should be finished at her house. At first, indeed, she did not care, said she, to have such doings in it. She would not, for a thousand pounds, have any of the servants or apprentices know it. Her precious good name would be gone forever, with the like excuses. However, on superior objections to all other expedients, while she took care to start none but those who were most liable to them, he came round at last to the necessity of her obliging him in that conveniency, and of doing a little more where she had already done so much. The night, then, was fixed, with all possible respect to the eagerness of his impatience, and in the meantime Mrs. Cole had omitted no instructions nor even neglected any preparation that might enable me to come off with honour in regard to the appearance of my virginity. Except that, favoured as I was by nature, with all the narrowness of stricture in that part requisite to conduct my designs, I had no occasion to borrow those auxiliaries of art that create a momentary one easily discovered by the test of a warm bath. And as to the usual sanguinary symptoms of defloration, which, if not always, are generally attendants on it, Mrs. Cole had made me the mistress of an invention of her own, which could hardly miss its effect, and of which more in its place. Everything then being disposed and fixed for Mr. Norbert's reception, he was, at the hour of eleven at night, with all the mysteries of silence and secrecy, let in by Mrs. Cole herself, and introduced into her bedchamber, where, in an old-fashioned bed of hers, I lay fully undressed and panting, if not with the fears of a real maid, at least with those perhaps greater of a dissembled one, which gave me an air of confusion and bashfulness that maiden modesty had all the honour of, and was indeed scarce distinguishable from it, even by less partial eyes than those of my lover. So let me call him, for I ever thought the term cully too cruel a reproach for the men for their abused weakness for us. As soon as Mrs. Cole, after the old gossipry on these occasions, used to young women abandoned for the first time to the will of man, had left us alone in her room, which, by the by, was well lighted up at his previous desire, that seemed to bode a stricter examination that he afterwards made. Mr. Norbert, still dressed, sprung towards the bed, where I got my head under the clothes, 
and defended them a good while before he could even get at my lips to kiss them. So true it is that a false virtue on this occasion even makes a greater rout and resistance than a true one. From thence he descended to my breasts. The feeler disputed tooth and nail with him till, tired with my resistance, and thinking probably to give a better account of me, when got into bed to me, he hurried his clothes off in an instant and came into bed. Meanwhile, by the glimpse I stole of him, I could easily discover a person far from promising any such doughty performances as the storming of maidenhead generally requires, and whose flimsy consumptive texture gave him more the air of an invalid that was pressed than of a volunteer on such hot service. At scarce thirty, he had already reduced his strength of appetite down to a wretched dependence on forced provocatives, very little squandered by the natural power of a body jaded and racked off to the lees by constant repeated overdrafts of pleasure, which had done the work of sixty winters on his springs of life, leaving him at the same time all the fire and heat of youth in his imagination, which served at once to torment and spur him down the precipice. As soon as he was in bed, he threw off the bedclothes, which I suffered him to force from my hold, and I now lay as exposed as he could wish, not only to his attacks, but his visitation of the sheets, where in the various agitations of the body, through my endeavours to defend myself, he could easily assure himself there was no preparation, though, to do him justice, he seemed a less strict examinant than I had apprehended from so experienced a practitioner. My shift, then, he fairly tore open, finding I made too much use of it to barricade my breasts, as well as the more important avenue, Yet in everything else he proceeded with the marks of tenderness and regard to me, whilst the art of my play was to show none for him. I acted then all the niceties, apprehensions, and terrors supposable for a girl, perfectly innocent to feel at so great a novelty as a naked man in bed with her for the first time. He scarce even obtained a kiss but what he ravished. I put his hand away twenty times from my breasts, where he had satisfied himself of their hardness and consistence with passing for hitherto unhandled goods. But when grown impatient for the main point, he now threw himself upon me, and first trying to examine me with his finger, sought to make himself further away. I complained of his usage bitterly. I thought he would not have served the body so. I was ruined. I did not know what I had done. I would get up, so I would and at the same time kept my thighs so fast blocked that it was not for strength like his to force them open or do any good. Finding thus my advantages, and that I had both my own and his motions at command, the deceiving him came so easy that it was perfectly playing upon velvet. In the meantime, his machine, which was one of those sizes that slip in and out without being minded, kept pretty stiffly bearing against that part which the shutting my thighs barred access to. But finding at length he could do no good by mere dint of bodily strength, he resorted to entreaties and arguments, to which I only answered with a tone of shame and timidity that I was afraid he would kill me. Lord, I would not be served so. I was never so used all my born days. I wondered he was not ashamed of himself, so I did with such silly, infantile moods of repulse and complaint as I judged best adapted to the expressive character of innocence and affright. Pretending, however, to yield at length to the vehemence of his insistence, in action and words, I sparingly disclosed my thighs, so that he could just touch the cloven inlet with the tip of his instrument. But as he fatigued and toiled to get it in, a twist of my body, so as to receive it obliquely, not only thwarted his admission, but giving a scream as if he had pierced me to the heart, I shook him off with such violence that he could not with all his might to it keep the saddle. Vexed indeed at this he seemed, but not in the style of any displeasure with me for my skittishness. On the contrary, I dare swear he held me the dearer and hugged himself for the difficulties that even hurt his instant pleasure. Fired, however, now beyond all bearance of delay, he remounts, 
and begged of me to have patience, stroking and soothing me to it by all tenderest endearments, and protestations of which he would moreover do for me. At which, feigning to be something softened, and abating of the anger that I had shown at his hurting me so prodigiously, I suffered him to lay my thighs aside, and make way for a new trial. But I watched the directions and managements of his point so well, that no sooner was the orifice in the least open to it, but I gave such a timely jerk, as seemed to proceed not from the evasion of his entry, but from the pain his efforts at it put me to. A circumstance, too, that I did not fail to accompany with proper gestures, sighs, and cries of complaint, of which that he had hurt me, he killed me, I should die, were the most frequent interjections. But now, after repeated attempts, in which he had not made the least impression towards gaining his point, at least for that time, the pleasure rose so fast upon him that he could not check or delay it, and in the vigour and fury which the approaches of the height of it inspired him, he made one fierce thrust that had almost put me by my guard, and lodged it so far that I could feel the warm inspersion just within the exterior orifice, which I had the cruelty not to let him finish there, but drew him out again, not without a most piercing loud exclamation, as if the pain had put me beyond all regard of being overheard. It was easy then to observe that he was more satisfied, more highly pleased with the supposed motives of his book of consummation than he would have been at the full attainment of it. It was on this foot that I solved to myself all the falsity I employed to procure him that blissful pleasure in it which most certainly he would not have tasted in the truth of things. Eased, however, and relieved by one discharge, he now applied himself to soothe and courage and to put me into humour and patience to bear his next attempt, which he began to prepare and gather force for, from all the incentives of the touch and sight which he could think of, by examining every individual part of my whole body, which he declared his satisfaction with in raptures of applauses, kisses, universally imprinted, and sparing no part of me, in all the eagerest wantonness of feeling, seeing, and toying. His vigour, however, did not return so soon, and I felt him more than once pushing at the door, but so little in a condition to break in, that I questioned whether he had the power to enter, had he held it ever so open. But this he then thought me too little acquainted with the nature of things to have any regret or confusion about, and he kept fatiguing himself and me for a long time, before he was in any state to resume his attacks with any prospect of success. And then I breathed him so warmly, and kept him so at bay, that before he had made any sensible progress in point of penetration, he was deliciously sweated, and wearied out indeed, so that it was deep in the morning before he achieved his second let-go, about halfway of entrance, I all the while crying and complaining of his prodigious vigour, and the immensity of what I appeared to suffer splitting up with. Tired, however, at length, with such athletic drudgery, my champion began now to give out, and to gladly embrace the refreshment of some rest. Kissing me then with much affection, and recommending me to my repose, he presently fell fast asleep, which as soon as I had well satisfied myself of, I was much composure of body, so as not to wake him by any motion, with much ease and safety too, played of Mrs. Cole's advice for perfecting the signs of my virginity. In each of the head bedposts, just above where the bedsteads are inserted into them, there was a small drawer, so artfully adapted to the mouldings of the timber work that it might have escaped even the most curious search. While drawers were easily opened or shut by the touch of a spring, and were fitted, each with a shallow glass tumbler, full of a prepared fluid blood, in which lay soaked for ready use, a sponge that required no more than gently reaching the hand to it, taking it out, and properly squeezing between the thighs, when it yielded a great deal more of the red liquid than would save a girl's honour, after which, replacing it, and touching the spring, all possibility of discovery, or even of suspicion, was taken away. And all this was not the work of the fourth part of a minute, and on whichever side one lay, the thing was equally easy and practicable by the double care taken to have each bedpost provided alike. 
True it is that had he waked and caught me in the act, it would at least have covered me with shame and confusion. But then that he did not was, with the precautions I took, a risk of a thousand to one in my favour. At ease now, and out of all fear of any doubts or suspicion on his side, I addressed myself in good earnest to my repose, but could obtain none. And in about half an hour's time, my gentleman waked again, and turning towards me, I feigned a sound sleep, which he did not long respect, but girding himself again to renew the onset, he began to kiss and caress me, when now making as if I'd just waked. I complained of the disturbance, and of the cruel pain that this little rest had stole my senses from. Eager, however, for the pleasure, as well of consummating an entire triumph over my virginity, he said everything that could overcome my resistance, and bribed my patience to the end, which I was not ready to listen to, from being secure of the bloody proofs I had prepared of his victorious violence, though I still thought it good policy not to let him in yet a while. I answered then only to his importunities, in sighs and moans, that I was so hurt I could not bear it. I was sure he had done me a mischief, that he had. He was such a sad man. At this, turning down the clothes, and viewing the field of battle by the glimmer of a dying taper, he saw plainly my thighs, shifts, and sheets, all stained with what he readily took for a virgin effusion, proceeding from his last half-penetration. Convinced and transported at which nothing could equal his joy and exultation. The illusion was complete. No other completion entered his head but that of his having been at work upon an unopened mind, which idea so strong an evidence redoubled at once his tenderness for me and his ardour for breaking it wholly up. Kissing me then with the utmost rapture, he comforted me and begged my pardon for the pain he had put me to, observing withal that it was only a thing in course, but the worst was certainly past, and that with a little courage and constancy I should get it once well over and never after experience anything but the greatest pleasure. By and little I suffered myself to be prevailed on, and giving, as it were, up the point to him, I made my thighs, insensibly spreading them, yield him liberty of access, which improving he got a little within me, when by a well-managed reception I worked the female screw so nicely that I kept him from the easy mid-channel direction, and by dexterous wreathing and contortions, creating an artificial difficulty of entrance, made him win it inch by inch, with the most laborious struggles, I all the while sorely complaining, till at length, with might and main, winding his way in, he got it completely home, and giving my virginity, as he thought, the coup de grace, furnishing me with the cue of setting up a terrible outcry, whilst he, triumphant, and like a cock clapping his wings over his downtrod mistress, pursued his pleasure, which presently rose in virtue of this idea of a complete victory to a pitch that made me soon sensible of his melting period, whilst I now lay acting the deep wounded, breathless, frightened, undone, no longer made. He would ask me, perhaps, whether all this time I enjoyed any perception of pleasure? I assure you, little or none, till just towards the latter end, a faintish sense of it came on mechanically from so long a struggle and frequent fret in that ever-sensible part. But in the first place I had no taste for the person I was suffering the embraces of, on a pure mercenary account, and then I was not entirely delighted with myself for the jade's part I was playing, whatever excuses I might have to plead for my being brought into it. But then this insensibility kept me so much the mistress of my mind and motions that I could the better manage to close a counterfeit through the whole scene of deception. Recovered at length to a more show of life, by his tender condolences, kisses and embraces, I upbraided him and reproached him with my ruin in such natural terms as added to his satisfaction with himself for having accomplished it. And guessing by certain observations of mine that it would be rather favourable to him to spare him when he some time after, feebly enough, came on again to the assault, I resolutely withstood any further endeavours on a pretext that flattered his prowess, of my being so violently hurt and sore that I could not possibly endure a fresh trial. He then graciously granted me a respite, and the next morning, soon after advancing, I got rid of further importunity, till Mrs. Cole, being rang for by him, came in and was made acquainted 
in terms of the utmost joy and rapture, with his triumphant certainty of my virtue and the finishing stroke he had given in the course of the night, of which, he added, she would see proof enough in bloody characters on the sheets. You may guess how a woman of her turn of address and experience humoured the jest and played him off with mixed exclamations of shame, anger, compassion for me, and of her being pleased that it was so well over, in which last, I believe, she was certainly sincere. And now, as the objection which she had represented as an invincible one, to my lying the first night at his lodgings, which were studiously calculated for freedom of intrigues, on the account of my maiden fears and terrors at the thoughts of going to a gentleman's chambers, and being alone with him in bed, was surmounted, she pretended to persuade me, in favour to him, that I should go there to him whenever he pleased, and still keep up all the necessary appearances of working with her, that I might not lose with my character the prospect of getting a good husband, and at the same time her house would be kept the safer from scandal. All this seemed so reasonable, so considerate to Mr. Norbert, that he never once perceived that she did not want him to resort to her house, lest he might in time discover certain inconsistencies with the character that she had set out with him. Besides that, this plan greatly flattered his own ease and views of liberty. Leaving me then to my much-wanted rest, he got up, and Mrs. Cole, after settling with him all points relating to me, got him undiscovered out of the house. After which, as I was awake, she came in and gave me due praises for my success. Behaving too with her usual moderation and disinterestedness, she refused any share of the sum I had thus earned, and put me into such a secure and easy way of disposing of my affairs, which now amounted to a kind of little fortune, that a child of ten years old might have kept the account and property of them safe in its hands. I was now restored again to my former state of a kept mistress, and used punctually to wait on Mr. Norbert at his chambers whenever he sent a messenger for me, which I constantly took care to be in the way of, and managed with so much caution that he never once penetrated the nature of my connections with Mrs. Cole, but indolently given up to ease and the town dissipations, the perpetual hurry of them hindered him from looking into his own affairs, much less to mine. In the meantime, I may judge from my own experience, none are better paid or better treated during their reign than the mistresses of those who, and of it by nature, debaucheries or age, have the least employment to the sex. Sensible that a woman must be satisfied some way, they ply her with a thousand little tender attentions, presents, caresses, confidences, and exhaust their inventions in means and devices to make up for the capital deficiency. And even towards lessening that, what arts, what modes, what refinements of pleasure have they not recourse to, to raise their languid powers and press nature into the service of their sensuality? But here is their misfortune that when by a course of teasing, worrying, handling, wanton postures, lascivious motions, they have at length accomplished a flashy and of it enjoyment, that at the same time lighted up a flame in the object of their passion, that, not having the means themselves to quench, drives her for relief into the next person's arms, who can finish their work, and thus they become boards to some favourite, tried and approved of, for a more vigorous and satisfactory execution. For with women, of our turn especially, however well our hearts may be disposed, there is a controlling part, or queen's seat in us, that governs itself by its own maxims of state, amongst which not one is stronger in practice with it than in the matter of its dues, never to accept the will for the deed. Mr. Norbert, who was much in this ungracious case, though he professed to like me extremely, could but seldom consummate the main joy itself with me, without such a length and variety of preparations as were at once wearisome and inflammatory. Sometimes he would strip me stark naked on a carpet by a good fire, when he would contemplate me almost by the hour, disposing me in all the figures and attitudes of body that it was susceptible of being viewed in, kissing me in every part, the most secret and critical one, so far from accepted that it received most of that branch of homage. 
Then his touches were so exquisitely wanton, so luxuriously diffused and penetrative at times, that he had made me perfectly rage with titillating fires, when, after all, and with much ado, he had gained a short-lived erection, and would perhaps melt it away in a washy sweat, or a premature abortive effusion that provokingly mocked my eager desires, or, if carried home, how faltered and unnervous the execution. How insufficiently the sprinkle of a few heat drops to extinguish all the flames he had kindled. One evening, I cannot help remembering that returning home from him, with a spirit he had raised in a circle his wand had proved too weak to lay, as I turned the corner of a street, I was overtaken by a young sailor. I was then in that spruce, neat, plain dress which I ever affected, and perhaps might have in my trip, a certain air of restlessness, unknown to the composure of cooler thoughts. However, he seized me as a prize, and without farther ceremony, threw his arms round my neck, and kissed me boisterously and sweetly. I looked at him with a beginning of anger and indignation at his rudeness, that softened away into other sentiments as I viewed him, for he was tall, manly carriaged, handsome of body and face, so that I ended my stare with asking him, in a tone turned to tenderness, what he meant. At which, with the same frankness and vivacity as he had begun with me, he proposed treating me with a glass of wine. Now, certain it is that had I been in a calmer state of blood than I was, had I not been under the dominion of unappeased irritations and desires, I should have refused him without hesitation. But I do not know how it was, my pressing calls, his figure, the occasion, and if you will, the powerful combination of all these, with a start of curiosity to see the end of an adventure, so novel, too, as being treated like a common street plier, made me give a silent consent. In short, it was not my head that I now obeyed. I suffered myself to be towed along, as it were, by this man of war, who took me under his arm as familiarly as if he had known me all his lifetime, and led me into the next convenient tavern, where we were shown into a little room on one side of the passage. Here, scarce allowing himself patience till the waiter brought in the wine called for, he fell directly on board me, when, untucking my handkerchief and giving me a snatching bus, he laid my breasts bare at once, which he handled with that keenness of lust that abridges a ceremonial ever more tiresome than pleasing on such pressing occasions. And now, hurrying towards the main point, we found no conveniency to our purpose, two or three disabled chairs and a rickety table composing the whole furniture of the room. Without more ado, he plants me with my back standing against the wall and my petticoats up, and coming out with a splitter indeed made it shine as he brandished it in my eyes, and going to work with an impetuosity and eagerness, bred very lightly by a long fasted sea, went to give me a taste of it. I straddled, I humoured my posture, and did my best in short to buckle it. I took part in it too, but still things did not go to his thorough liking. Changing then in a trice his system of battery, he leads me to the table, and with a master hand lays my head down on the edge of it, and with the other canting up my petticoats and shift, bears my naked posteriors to his blind and furious guide. It forces its way between them, and I feeling pretty sensibly that it was not going by the right door, and knocking desperately at the wrong one, I told him of it. Pooh, says he, my dear, any port in a storm. Altering, however, directly his course, and lowering his point, he fixed it right, and driving it up with a delicious stiffness, made all foam again, and gave me the tout with such fire and spirit, that in the fine disposition I was in when I submitted to him, and stirred up so fiercely as I was, I got the start of him, and went away into the melting swoon, and squeezing him, whilst in the convulsive grasp of it, drew from him such a plenteous bedewal as, joined to my own effusion, perfectly floated those parts, and drowned in a deluge all my raging conflagration of desire. When this was over, how to make my retreat was my concern, 
for though I had been so extremely pleased with the difference between this warm broadside poured so briskly into me, and the tiresome pawing and toying to which I had owed the unappeased flames that had driven me into this step, now I was grown cooler, I began to apprehend the danger of contracting an acquaintance with this, however agreeable, stranger, who on his side spoke of passing the evening with me and continuing our intimacy with an air of determination that made me afraid of its being not so easy to get away from him as I could wish. In the meantime, I carefully concealed my uneasiness and readily pretended to consent to stay with him, telling him I should only step to my lodgings to leave a necessary direction and then instantly return. This he very glibly swallowed, on the notion of my being one of those unhappy street errands who devote himself to the pleasure of the first ruffian that will stoop to pick them up, and of course that I would scarce bilk myself of my hire by my not returning to make the most of the job. Thus he parted with me, not before, however, he had ordered in my hearing a supper, which I had the barbarity to disappoint him of my company to. But when I got home and told Mrs. Cole my adventure, she represented so strongly in me the nature and dangerous consequences of my folly, particularly the risks to my health, in being so open-legged and free, that I not only took resolutions never to venture so rashly again, which I inviolably preserved, but passed a good many days in continual uneasiness, lest I should have met with other reasons besides the pleasure of that encounter, to remember it. But these fears wronged my pretty sailor, for which I gladly make him this reparation. I had now lived with Mr. Norbert near a quarter of a year, in which space I circulated my time very pleasantly between my amusements at Mrs. Cole's and a proper attendance on that gentleman, who paid me profusely for the unlimited complaisance with which I passively humoured every caprice of pleasure, and which had won upon him so greatly, that finding, as he said, all that variety in me alone which he had sought for in a number of women, I had made him lose his taste for inconstancy and new faces. But what was yet at least agreeable, as well as more flattering, the love I had inspired him with bred a deference to me that was of great service to his health, for having by degrees and with most pathetic representations brought him to some husbandry of it and to ensure the duration of his pleasures by moderating their use and correcting those excesses in them he was so addicted to and which had shattered his constitution and destroyed his powers of life in the very point for which he seemed chiefly desirous to live he was grown more delicate, more temperate and in course more healthy his gratitude for which was taking a turn very favourable for my fortune, when once more the caprice of it dashed the cup from my lips. His sister, Lady L., for which he had a great affection, desiring him to accompany her down to Bath for her health, he could not refuse her such a favour, and accordingly, though he counted on staying away from me no more than a week at farthest, he took his leave of me, with an ominous heaviness of heart, and left me a sum far above the state of his fortune, and very inconsistent with the intended shortness of his journey. But it ended in the longest that can be, and is never but once taken, for arrived at Bath, he was not there two days before he fell into a debauch of drinking with some gentleman that threw him into a high fever and carried him off in four days' time, never once out of a delirium, had he been in his senses to make a will, perhaps he might have made favourable mention of me in it. Thus, however, I had lost him, and as no condition of life is more subject to revolutions than that of a woman of pleasure, I soon recovered my cheerfulness, and now beheld myself once more struck off the list of kept mistresses, and returned into the bosom of the community from which I had been in some manner taken." Mrs. Cole, still continuing her friendship, offered me her assistance and advice towards another choice, but I was now in ease and affluence enough to look about me at leisure. And as to any constitutional calls of pleasure, their pressure or sensibility, 
was greatly lessened by a consciousness of the ease with which they were to be satisfied at Mrs. Cole's house, where Louisa and Emily still continued in the old way, and my great favourite Harriet used often to come and see me and entertain me with her head and heart full of the happiness she enjoyed with her dear baronet, whom she loved with tenderness and constancy, even though he was her keeper, and what is yet more, had made her independent by a handsome provision for her and hers. I was then in this vacancy from any regular employ of my person in my way of business, when one day Mrs. Cole, in the course of the constant confidence we lived in, acquainted me that there was one Mr. Barville, who used her house, just come to town, whom she was not a little perplexed about providing a suitable companion for, which was indeed a point of difficulty, as he was under the tyranny of a cruel taste, that of an ardent desire, not only of being unmercifully whipped himself, but of whipping others, in such sort that though he paid extravagantly for those who had the courage and complaisance to submit to his humour, there were few, delicate as he was in the choice of his subjects, who would exchange turns with him so terrible at the expense of their skin. But what yet increased the oddity of this strange fancy was the gentleman being young, whereas it generally attacks, it seems, such as are, through age, obliged to have recourse in this experiment for quickening the circulation of their sluggish juices and determining a conflux in the spirits of pleasure towards those flagging, shriveling parts that rise to life only by virtue of those titillating ardours created by the discipline of their opposites, with which they have so surprising a consent. This Mrs. Cole could not well acquaint me with in any expectation of my offering my service, for sufficiently easy as I was in my circumstances, it must have been the temptation of an immense interest indeed that could have induced me to embrace such a job. Neither had I ever expressed, nor indeed felt, the least impulse or curiosity to know more of a taste that promised so much more pain than pleasure to those that stood in no need of such violent goads. What then should move me to subscribe myself voluntarily to a party of pain for knowing it such? Why, to tell the plain truth, it was a sudden caprice, a gust of fancy for trying a new experiment, mixed with the vanity of proving my personal courage to Mrs. Cole, that determined me, at all risks, to propose myself to her, and relieve her from any farther lookout. Accordingly, I at once pleased and surprised her with a frank and unreserved tender of my person to her, and her friend's absolute disposal on this occasion. My good temporal mother was, however, so kind as to use all the arguments she could imagine to dissuade me, but, as I found, they only turned on a motive of tenderness to me. I persisted in my resolution, and thereby acquitted my offer of any suspicion of its not having been sincerely made, or out of compliment only. Acquiescing then, thankfully in it, Mrs. Cole assured me that baiting the pain I should be put to, she had no scruple to engage me to this party, which she assured me I should be liberally paid for, and which the secrecy of the transaction preserved safe from the ridicule that otherwise vulgarly attended it, that for her part she considered pleasure of one sort or other as the universal port of destination, and every wind that blew thither a good one, provided it blew nobody any harm, that she rather compassionated than blamed those unhappy persons who are under a subjection they cannot shake off, to those arbitrary tastes that rule their appetites of pleasure with an unaccountable control. Tastes, too, as infinitely diversified, as superior to and independent of, all reasoning as the different relishes or palates of mankind in their vines, some delicate stomachs nauseating plain meats and finding no savour but in high-seasoned luxurious dishes, whilst others again pique themselves upon detesting them. I stood now in no need of this preamble of encouragement or justification. My word was given, and I was determined to fulfil my engagements. 
Accordingly, the night was set, and I had all the necessary previous instructions how to act and conduct myself. The dining room was duly prepared and lighted up, and the young gentleman posted there in waiting for my introduction to him. I was then by Mrs. Cole brought in and presented to him in a loose dishable fitted by her direction to the exercise I was to go through, all in the finest linen and a thorough white uniform, gown, petticoat, stockings and satin slippers, like a victim led to sacrifice, whilst my dark auburn hair, falling in drop curls over my neck, created a pleasing distinction of colour from the rest of my dress. As soon as Mr. Barville saw me, he got up with a visible air of pleasure and surprise, and saluting me, asked Mrs. Cole if it was possible that so fine and delicate a creature would voluntarily submit to such sufferings and rigours as were the subject of his assignation. She answered him properly, and now, reading in his eyes that she could not too soon leave us together, she went out, after recommending to him to use moderation with so tender a novice. But whilst she was employing his attention, mine had been taken up with examining the figure and person of this unhappy young gentleman, who was thus unaccountably condemned to have his pleasure lashed into him, as boys have their learning. He was exceedingly fair and smooth-complexioned, and appeared to me no more than twenty at most, though he was three years older than what my conjectures gave him, but then he owed this favourable mistake to a habit of fatness, which spread through a short, squab stature, and a round, plump, fresh-coloured face gave him greatly the look of a buckus, had not an air of austerity, not to say sternness, very unsuitable even to his shape of face, dashed that character of joy necessary to complete the resemblance. His dress was extremely neat but plain, and far inferior to the ample fortune he was in full possession of. This, too, was a taste in him, and not avarice. As soon as Mrs. Cole was gone, he seated me near him, when now his face changed upon me into an expression of the most pleasing sweetness and good humour, the more remarkable for its sudden shift from the other extreme, which I found afterwards, when I knew more of his character, was owing to the habitual state of conflict with and dislike of himself for being enslaved to so peculiar a gust by the fatality of a constitutional ascendant that rendered him incapable of receiving any pleasure till he submitted to these extraordinary means of procuring it at the hands of pain, whilst the constancy of this repining consciousness stamped at length that cast of sourness and severity on his features, which was, in fact, very foreign to the natural sweetness of his temper. After a competent preparation by apologies and encouragement to go through my part with spirit and constancy, he stood up near the fire, whilst I went to fetch the instruments of discipline out of a closet hard by. There were several rods, made each of two or three strong twigs of birch tied together, which he took, handled, and viewed with as much pleasure as I did with a kind of shuddering presage. Next we took from the side of the room a long, broad bench, made easy to lie at length on by a soft cushion in a calico cover, and everything now being ready, he took his coat and waistcoat off, and, at his motion and desire, I unbuttoned his breeches, and rolling up his shirt rather above his waist, tucked in securely there, when directing naturally my eyes to that humorsome master movement in whose favour all these dispositions were making, it seemed almost shrunk into his body, scarce showing its tip above the sprout of hairy curls that clothed those parts, as you may have seen a wren peep its head out of the grass. Stooping then to untie his garters, he gave them me for the use of tying him down to the legs of the bench, a circumstance no farther necessary than, as I suppose, it made part of the humour of the thing, since he prescribed it to himself, amongst the rest of the ceremonial. I led him to the bench, and according to my cue, played at forcing him to lie down, which, after some little show of reluctance, for form's sake, 
he submitted to. He was straightway extended flat upon his belly on the bench, with a pillow under his face, and as he thus tamely lay, I tied him slightly hand and foot to the legs of it, which done, his shirt remaining trussed up over the small of his back, I drew his breeches quite down to his knees, and now he lay in all the fairest, broadest display of that part of the back view, in which a pair of chubby, smooth-cheeked, and passing white posteriors rose cushioning upwards from two stout, fleshful thighs, and ending the cleft or separation by a union at the small of the back, presented a bold mark that swelled, as it were, to meet the scourge. Seizing now one of the rods, I stood over him, and, according to his direction, gave him in one breath ten lashes with much good will, and the utmost nerve and vigour of arm that I could put to them, so as to make those fleshy orbs quiver again under them, whilst he himself seemed no more concerned, or to mind them, than a lobster would a flea bite. In the meantime, I viewed intently the effects of them, which to me at least appeared surprisingly cruel. Every lash had skimmed the surface of those white cliffs, which they deeply reddened, and lapping round the side of the furthermost from me, cut specially into the dimple of it such livid wheels as the blood either span out from or stood in large drops on. And from some of the cuts, I picked out even the splinters of the rod that had stuck in his skin. Nor was this raw work to be wondered at, considering the greenness of the twigs and the severity of the infliction. Whilst the whole surface of his skin was so smooth as stretched, over the hard and firm pulp of flesh that filled it, as to yield no play or elusive swagging under the stroke, which thereby took place the more plumb and cut into the quick. I was, however, already so moved at the piteous sight that I from my heart repented the undertaking and would willingly have given over, thinking he had full enough, but he encouraging and beseeching me earnestly to proceed, I gave him ten more lashes, and then resting, surveyed the increase of bloody appearances. And at length, steeled to the sight by his stoutness in suffering, I continued the discipline by intervals, till I observed him wreathing and twisting his body in a way that I could plainly perceive was not the effect of pain, but of some new and powerful sensation. Curious to dive into the meaning of which, in one of my pauses of intermission, I approached, as he still kept working and grinding his belly against the cushion under him, and first stroking the untouched and unhurt side of the flesh mount next me, then softly insinuating my hand under his thigh, felt the posture things were in forwards. Which was indeed surprising, for that machine of his, which I had by its appearance taken for an impalpable or at best a very diminutive subject, was now, in virtue of all that smart and havoc of his skin behind, grown not only to a prestigious stiffness of erection, but to a size that frighted even me, a non-pareil sickness indeed. The head of it alone filled the utmost capacity of my grasp. And when, as he heaved and wriggled to and fro, in the agitation of his strange pleasure, it came into view, it had something of the air of a round fillet of the whitest veal, and, like its owner, squab, and short in proportion to its breadth. But when he felt my hand there, he begged I would go on briskly with my jerking, or he should never arrive at the last stage of pleasure. Resuming then the rod and the exercise of it, I had fairly worn out three bundles, when, after an increase of struggles and motion, and a deep sigh or two, I saw him lie still and motionless, and now he desired me to desist, which I instantly did, and proceeding to untie him, I could not but be amazed at his passive fortitude, on viewing the skin of his butchered, mangled posteriors, laid so white, smooth and polished, now all on one side of them a confused cutwork of wheels, livid flesh, gashes and gore, insomuch as when he stood up he could scarce walk. In short, he was in sweet briars. Then I plainly perceived on the cushion the marks of a plenteous effusion, 
and already had his sluggard member run up to its old nestling place, and enforced itself again, as if ashamed to show its head, which nothing, it seems, could raise but stripes inflicted on its opposite neighbours, who were thus constantly obliged to suffer for his caprice. End of part eight.